So um, thank you very much. We'll move on to uh, our final talk for this session, which is uh, from Sam Wilkinson, uh, who is also a uh, postdoctoral um, uh, researcher at the University uh, of Birmingham, um, who has been working on the COG UK uh, project and the uh, uh, Climb COVID project. So uh, Sam is, is um, uh, taking over the maintenance of the Arctic bioinformatics pipeline, where we have had some questions about already, uh, which, we'll, we, which we will address. But Sam is going to give an overview of the Arctic uh, pipeline, both for Illumina and Nanopores uh, analysis, and also um, the next flow uh, workflow manager. Uh, so Sam, um, over to you, um, please share your presentation. Sure, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, right. So. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk about the Arctic Next Flow uh, Nanopore Illumina pipeline, uh, which uh, was just before I got anywhere. It was originally written by Matt Bull. Uh, so full credit to him. Uh, and uh, it's also based on the nano on the nanopore side is based on the original arctic pipeline which is written by nick and will row so move onwards who am i well nick's already introduced me uh feel free to if you have any questions beyond the talk i'm on twitter or you can email me uh but so yeah feel free so the first question i suppose is what does the pipeline actually do so a very, very, very uh, wide overview, the input of the Arctic pipeline is the raw sequence data from a sequencing platform, either Illumina or Nanopore. And the output is, well, there are multiple outputs, but the main one you really want, and most people are after, is a consensus sequence, which is representative of the sample that was sequenced. So what does that mean? Why is it important? A consensus sequence, I'm sure that a lot of people do know this, but just to make sure everyone's on the same page, a consensus sequence is effectively a, you can think of it almost like a summary. When you have lots and lots and lots of reads from a sequencer, you take all of those reads and figure out, you know, where they agree. And from that, you can construct a genome that is the same length as well, which is, a full length single uh, C series of ACs, Ts, and Gs, which is representative of the sample genome. So that also enables us to um, uh, work with large, large data sets. Because if you were to talking about you know raw read data, you, you that's megabytes and megabytes and megabytes, if not gigabytes in some cases. So you can't really compare that between samples easily. Whereas with the SARS CoV 2 genome, which is 30,000 base pairs ish you can quite easily compare those on very large scales. So how do we do that? We take sequencing reads and align them to the reference genome. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, that's the Wuhan reference genome. And what aligning basically means is you take the read, which is a, you know, however long series of ACs, Ts and Gs, and you figure out where in the reference genome that fits and where does it fit the best that's when you have all of those uh, in the places where they fit the best that's they're all aligned so from that you then determine where the aligned reads differ from the reference which is also called variant calling and that's really important because that's how you spot mutations uh, uh, of different kinds you know you have substitutions you have insertions you have deletions and things like that so it's really important, obviously, to tell where it's different from the reference. And from that, you construct a consensus sequence, which is based on those differences and the original reference. So here's a flowchart I made, which I know looks very complicated. Just to quickly, it's probably a strong word, to summarize how the Arctic pipelines work. So, uh, just before we get going, as I said before, 
there are two sort of Arctic pipelines that you could get confused with. The Arctic pipeline that most people talk about is the one written by Nick and Will and is purely for nanopore data. Um, whereas uh, the Arctic Nextflow pipeline does Illumina and nanopore, but it already, it uses the first Arctic pipeline. And I know that's very confusing. So um, I hope that that doesn't confuse people too much. So on the left, we start with raw data for nanopore and alumina. Then we move to the next stage, which is read prep. In the case of nanopore, that's the Arctic Guppyplex stage. And what that does is take all of the individual read files, of which you have lots and lots, and it does some quality control on them and puts them all into one easy to handle fast queue file. Okay. Then on the Illumina side, you have uh, trim reads for which uh, Matt used trim galore, which basically just takes off what's called the adapter sequences. Now, adapter sequences are, um, I think Josh actually referenced them a little bit uh, in his talk. They are effectively sequences that are required for the sequencer to work properly to, uh, to actually sequence things. However, that, what's important to remember about them is they're not representative of SARS-CoV-2 genome in question. So they need to go or they will mess up your alignments. So after that's done, you're going on to the next stage, which is alignment and alignment filtering. And that starts with aligning to the reference. So this is where the, uh, another point where they differ. On the nanopore side, we use Minimap 2, which is a tool written by Heng Li. Uh, there's a bit of a trend there actually for things being written by Heng Li, where the, all of these reads are aligned to the reference. And now remember what I mean about that, where they, you figure out where each read fits on the reference and where it sits most neatly. And you do that for all of the reads. And, and that could be anywhere up to, uh, I think some of the large I've seen for Illumina can be up to 20 odd million, although that is unreasonably large reads. Then on the nanopore side, you do the same thing, but you use BWA also by uh, Hengley, funnily enough. Um, and it, it's exactly the same. It's you are figuring out where these reads fit on the reference genome. So after that's done, they the pipelines do differ somewhat. Uh, the, on the nanopore side, you have a process called align trim, uh, which we uh, I will be talking about in more detail in a second. But what that effectively does is it figures out which reads are where reads which amplicon reads are representative of because with nanopore you will always assume that each read will be a full amplicon because that's just how it works and from that you can do a lot of figuring out of which alignments are actually bad and which reads are truncated or whatever so there's lots of things you can do there on the illumina side uh, all that's done is trimming the primer sequences from these reads in both cases, you require the prime scheme bed file, which is basically just the plain text file, which contains a lot of information about the primers. It says this primer goes in these positions on the reference. It's this long and it's part of this primer pool and it's paired with this other primer. So if you think about it, left primer, right primer. Okay. Uh, the uh, Illumina side uses IVAR trim and it just basically says, Optionally, you can chuck out reads which don't have a primer. However, that causes issues when you uh, use, uh, such as the Nextera workflow, which uh, fragments your amplicons. So um, that there are some differences there. But uh, um, uh, thank you, Nick. So. Um, after that, you move on to the consensus assembly um, part of the pipeline. On the nanopore side, we call variants using either the nanopolish or Medaka workflow. Now, these are both good. Uh, we recommend nanopolish, uh, but the main difference between them in terms, of, uh, in terms of what you would experience as a user is that nanopolish requires access to the original signal data produced by the nanopore sequencer. So that's the FAST5 files. Uh, whereas Medaka is perfectly fine with just the fast queue files. Um, the difference is fairly small. Medaka is, is a good workflow, but um, we do recommend nanopolish. Then on the uh, 
Illumina side, we uh, consensus is generated using IVAR consensus, as well as variant generated using IVAR variant. Uh, in case of uh, consensus, it's basically done um, using what's called a pileup. So it goes through each position on the consensus sequence and goes through all of the reads aligned to that position and says, right, how many ACs, Ts, and Gs have we got in this position? And then based on various filters and uh, parameters you can set, uh, you can then figure out, is it an A, C, D, or G, or is it mixed? Or There are lots of parameters you can play with that, but that's basically how the consensus is generated with IVAR. Whereas with uh, the Nanopore pipeline, uh, we use BCF tools, which uh, takes the variance, compares it to the reference, and from that generates a consensus. So there is a slight difference to how they are generated, but the end result is you have a consensus fast A, which is representative, hopefully representative, of the sample. Uh, quality control info, which is stuff like coverage, um, how many uh, amplicons dropped out, um, and, as well as a BAM file, which contains your reads aligned to the reference. So that's uh, mostly use uh, the, the only real databases that uh, accept those are the are the UK um, climb COVID uh, server, as well as uh, ENA, uh, which will accept the read files as well. So moving on to Amplicon handling in Nanopore. So reads are aligned to the reference and assigned to an Amplicon if the following um, standards are met. The primes are correctly paired. Now, how it does that is it goes through each read and decides based on the position, say for example, this one I'm pointing at here, where is the nearest primer to the start of the read? It then marks that and is, then goes to the other end of the read and says, okay, what's the nearest primer to this position? And says, right, it's this one. Okay, are these in a pair? Are they the left and right primers of a amplicon based upon the primer bed file? And if so, great, perfect. That's assigned to an amplicon. Also, does it cover the entire amplicon? Um, in Nanopore, that should always be true. And is the amplicon threshold not met? That's um, assuming that you have the normalization flag um, activated because basically above a certain point, uh, when you're sequencing like this, you can end up with huge, huge numbers of certain amplicons and not very many of others. So once you get to a certain threshold for an amplicon, say arbitrarily 100, um, above that, you have a lot, lot more reads, but you're not necessarily getting any more real information. So to make sure that you're not having huge, huge BAM files unnecessarily when you're not getting anything out of it, you, after that threshold, will just not worry about them. You know, you've got enough information, move on. Amplicon reads are then processed. Um, if a Amplicon, or sorry, a read goes outside of an Amplicon boundary, outside of the Amplicon boundary, it is trimmed, it's removed because that ought not to happen. Uh, and optionally, uh, we will trim a primer sequence. So the Arctic non-Nextflow pipeline, I said that was confusing, uh, outputs two BAM files. It outputs a trimmed and a primer trimmed BAM file. Now the difference is that in the trimmed one, you, inc you include, it's trimmed outside the Amplicon boundaries, However, it does still include the primers. Whereas with the primer trimmed, the primers are soft clipped. So they are not included. They are, they are still included, but they're not in, they're not going to be considered when uh, you're doing further work on that BAM file. And then you assign the read group to a primer pool. So uh, as Josh covered, you know, I'm sure you're all experts by now, uh, each you have what's called primer pools. So each primer pair is in a different primer pool, and that is then represented in the BAM header. So it says it's primer pool A or primer pool B for each amplicon, okay? And you can actually see here just a lovely little demonstration of um, this was, this is a diagram taken from uh, Will, um, Will's presentation last time, which uh, shows how you can uh, generate a consensus based on um, uh, the the pileup. So you can see a pileup here where you have all these A's, uh, whereas in the reference it's a G. So you can see that's a that's a substitution mutation. It's an A. Whereas here, when you've got 
an A in the reference and more A's than T's, you can assume that either it's contamination or a sequencing artifact or something like that. It's not actually representative, probably. So uh, yeah, so the question is, how do you run the pipeline? It's quite easy, actually. Here's an example of the uh, nanopore pipeline when you run it with Nextflow. It looks like a long command, but that's the one command you need to go from raw read information to all of the outputs required to um, upload to whatever database you prefer. So the idea is it's quite as easy as possible. So you go Nextflow, main.nf, um, or you can use Nextflow run and then the folder up to you entirely. Decide which profile you want to execute with. Uh, I suggest Conda. It's probably the easiest. It's certainly the simplest. What Conda does is it handles all of the dependencies of the pipeline for you. So it, it just means you don't have to worry about making sure you have the right version of sound tools, the right version of BWA, uh, whatever, um, or the Arctic pipeline. It handles that for you. And Nexo has got really, really good Conda support. You then say which workflow you want to use. In this case, Nano Polish which as I say, we suggest, but uh, Madaka is also good. Uh, if you do want to use Madaka, you will then have to give a Madaka model, which just says um, uh, which flow cell, uh, which version of the Nanopore flow cell was used to generate the information, um, which base calling version was used, uh, which instrument was used to generate the data, and that will change how Madaka treats the reads. Uh, you can then provide a prefix. Uh, that's optional, but it's usually good to do. It can be anything you want, however you want to identify the run. Uh, then you need to link the pipeline to the uh, folder containing your base called fastq files. Uh, by default, in the nano in a nanopore run directory, you will have uh, four folders containing uh, reads. You'll have your fastq pass, fastq fail, fast five pass, fast five fail. And in those, uh, you will have barcode directories. The pipeline is perfectly capable of picking out all of that and assuming that each barcode is a separate sequence, assuming you've multiplexed. Um, same thing with the fast five pass. Uh, you just pass, you just give it the directory in which your fast five pass files are, and then it will make sure that those are paired up properly when it comes to. Um, running nano polish. Uh, in the, if you're running Madaka, however, you do not need to give a fast five pass directory for obvious reasons. Uh, and then also you link to the sequencing summary file. Uh, again, this is purely for nano polish. That is a text file which just gives nano polish a lot of information about um, uh, which read was generated when, which fast five file it's in, and all sorts of things like that. So for Illumina, it's even simpler, really. Uh, you can just say nextflow, main.nf again, profile, conda, again, assuming you want to use that. It also supports Slurm, Docker, uh, singularity containers, things like that. Illumina, give it a prefix, tell it where the reads are, go. And then it, it will run. Uh, that's, I think, really the strength of this pipeline is the uh, simplicity for the end user because making it accessible for non-strictly bioinformaticians, I think, is really really powerful and, and certainly enables a lot more sequencing and well, bioinformatic analysis, analysis of uh, sequencing runs to be done worldwide. So why Nextflow? Uh, Nextflow is a workflow framework or a workflow manager, however you want to call it. It's sort of like a scripting language really, which allows us to chain together bioinformatics tools to process data and the way it does this is by abstracting a lot of um, things that you'd have to worry about for a bioinformatics analysis away from the end user. So it handles how the commands are executed. It handles which versions of the tools are used. It handles uh, the files, the files being moved around. So it makes sure if you, you know, assuming you've written the pipeline correctly, it will ensure that the right files are in the right place at the right time and everything has what it needs and uh, doesn't effectively uh, fail and it makes sure that every file stays with files that it should be with so you don't end up processing the forward reads of one 
sample and reverse reads of another sample, for example. Uh, yeah, so this is it. It means that the user doesn't have to handle intermediate files, install the tools themselves, or enter more and more command. And I, it's very powerful. So further work to be done. So this is what I'm, one of the things I'm working on at the moment actually is trying to improve the pipeline written by Matt Bull. So improvements, reduce the reliance on Conda. Now I was not telling the complete story about Conda earlier. Conda is great. It enables you to um, meet all your dependencies with very, very minimal effort. However, it's got problems. And one of those is that the problem size for uh, meeting dependencies has gotten so large now that it can sometimes just never solve. So a good example of that would be for the Arctic Conda package, the Arctic pipeline Conda package. I'm talking about the original Arctic pipeline here. Getting that to solve with Conda is very difficult these days, it's almost impossible, actually. If, if you can do it, you're very lucky. So the way that I've approached this is by working with what's called Mamba, which is a very, it's a drop-in replacement for Conda. You can install via Conda, actually, which is written uh, in, I believe, C uh, or C++. And it is a lot more efficient and will solve the Arctic pipeline, uh, Arctic package in seconds compared to hours to potentially never for Conda. And Nextflow, in, one, in the latest version anyway, has support for Mamba now. And that has uh, made the pipeline infinitely more user-friendly. So the next thing is to increase parity between the approaches utilized for Illumina and Nanopore data. Uh, so the way that um, Matt Ball wrote the Illumina pipeline it works. It is good. It's used by a lot of people all over the world. However, I think it would be re it's really handy. One of the things that we want is to see that, make sure that the approaches used are as similar as possible. Of course, Illumina data needs to be handled differently to Nanopore data, but where possible, it is good to make sure that we're using the same tools and the set, applying the same standards to generate our data because it is consistency is the name of the game when you're dealing with something as you know problems as large as this and also general quality of life improvements uh matt has not maintained the pipeline for for quite a long time uh and the uh, cracks are starting to show um the selecting your primer scheme version is a lot more challenging than it ought to be and a lot of other small niggling issues which i'm saying out to look out look at and also just to improve the lumina workflow certain uh, problems have come out uh that weren't anticipated when the pipeline was originally uh, conceived, uh, such as uh, allowing a step for length filtering Illumina reads and um, uh, uh, implementing uh, the Nanopore style Amplicon handling that I talked about earlier to work with the Illumina data, which is to say paired end data. So this is another, another big flow chart, uh, which is the version of the pipeline that I've, uh, I'm currently working on. I have got it working, but it's not uh, validate already for prime time quite yet. So watch this space. But the differences are that we use Minimap as in the Nanopore workflow. We length filter the reads. Um, that's user definable. Currently it's between 105 and 300, but that's entirely up to the user. Uses line trim, which has been modified. We call variants using free bays, which uh, is a more complex approach than uh, the simple pileup that I talked about earlier. Uh, and that uses Bayesian um, statistics to make much better guesses or, of, or uh, well, not guesses, much better judgments of what is a variant, what isn't. Uh, and then uses BCF tools, as we do in the Nanopore pipeline, to generate a consensus based on those variants rather than having a much more naive pile up as is done currently. And then that leads to the same outputs as before, hopefully with much more, uh, with much better data, well, or at least slightly better data. So uh, from that, uh, any questions? Um, if you don't ask them now, feel free to contact me at either of these, uh, either of these locations or on Slack or whatever. Excellent. Thank you.
very much, Sam. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat, actually. Okay. Um, and I think uh, my observation is that, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there are people are a little bit getting a bit confused about the number of different types of pipelines and how they all fit together. And some pipelines are really wrapping around existing pipelines, like the, the ones that Sam mentioned. Some are completely new implementations of the pipeline. Um, and uh, the ecosystem is 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 rather complex at, at this stage. So we'll try and answer your questions and try and get everyone on the same page. So let's quite go right back to the to earlier because there were some questions around bioinformatics around eleven o'clock. Um, so uh, the first question was from Gilham, which is which version of Arctic are you currently using? This is the Nanoport pipeline that he's referring to. Yeah, uh, 1.2.1 or 1.3.0 dev, but which is an effectively an unreleased version of the pipeline that Will was working on. Will uh, no longer works on Arctic. He go, he has gone to industry uh, to work uh, there, so he doesn't maintain that pipeline anymore. So that's why it hasn't been released yet. But he was wondering if there was an ETA on 1.3.0. Um, I mean, that's more of a question for you, Nick. I mean, I. I uh... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll answer that one. Um, we're still using 1.2.1, which works very well. Um, the 1.3 had um, the main change for 1.3 was to try and remove uh, remove the dependency on uh, a, a piece of software called Longshot, which was used in conjunction with the Medaka pipeline. So we didn't want to use Medaka and Longshot. We just wanted to use Medaka. Um, but in the development version, that support is enabled, but um, uh, it, it's not quite validated yet. So we haven't released it. There was another, it also fixes a common bug that people find where sometimes um, consensus genomes are not produced correctly or just not produced at all for certain samples. So um, probably what we will do is take that bug fix and put that in. Uh, and remove the, uh, the 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 thing about long shot for now because it, it, it's uh, we haven't got an alternative to that right now. Okay, so um, and then another question was um, I thought that oh here we are yeah so this is a question from Charles um, are you planning to release a v point four point one primer scheme compatible with Arctic one point two point one so that's the nanopore again which doesn't allow multi fast as reference. So um, I'll answer that actually because I we uh, it, we I I know what you're saying. Basically, the latest files that go with v four point one don't have multiple references in the reference file, and that pipeline doesn't work with that. We will fix that today. Uh, that was an error actually in the in the um, in the package for v four point one. It was very helpful to bring that to our attention. So thank you. Right, uh, let's go down. So. Um, um, here's a question from uh, Lays. I'm not sure I've pronounced that correctly. What minimum depth is recommended for consensus building for Illumina and Nanopore sequencing? Uh, so for Nanopore, uh, you usually look for 20 times depth. So 20 reads aligned to a position, making a, uh, uh, being valid for a consensus. Uh, whereas with Illumina, people usually go with 10. Um, I'm not entirely sure what goes into that number but 10 is the number that i'm aware of most people using yeah and those are the those are the default parameters mm. in, for the for the pipelines um those should give reasonably good results certainly illumina has an extremely low error rate so 10 if you have 10 reads all agreeing that's very good evidence that that, yeah. that threat mutation uh, nanopore sequence quality has improved drastically so 20 is probably okay yeah. um, but um, with nanopore sequencing the, the more coverage the better uh, we would say and, and ideally it's nice to have 100 or 200 x coverage on an amplicon for the best quality for the best results mm. um, so so the only caveat there is that at very low coverage levels if you imagine a situation where you have millions and millions of reads for a sample, and then you um, um, and, and then for, for certain um, regions you have very low coverage, like ten x, mm. 
Because you're very careful that you're not, that's not background contamination. Okay, so that's a kind of mismatch, that's kind of barcode misidentification or some uh, low level of contamination in the lab. Because if, if everything else is at very, very high coverage and one region is at very low coverage, that's sometimes a symptom of contamination. However, it's also sometimes a con uh, an indication of a low efficiency primer that Josh was talking about. So you just have your wits about you. But in terms of the raw sequencing error rate, those seem the right numbers. Okay, so uh, our term says, um, and there's another question relating to this. Um, if you sometimes have amplicons like P1 left, P3 right, are they filtered out or trimmed? Uh, yes. So if you have mismatched primers, so um, they will be they will be removed, basically. Yeah. So th that would basically happen if you had a very, very long read that went way beyond a single amplicon, um, you know, over two amplicons, really. Uh, in, in which case, yes, it would be removed uh, in um, both the uh, the nanopore version of the pipeline and the Illumina workflow that I am currently working on in the Arctic pipeline. It would be removed. And a related question to that is from Pedro, which is why why even trim or filter reads um, at all? What's the point? Well, effectively, you just want to make sure that your data is good. Um, there are multiple reasons you could have um, uh, reads which are not actually representative of the sample in question, such as seam tour error, um, contamination even, uh, um, uh, mispriming, uh, primer dimers. There's lots and lots and lots of little gotchas which can lead to bad data and, and have done. Uh, there are plenty of examples i mean just as jeremy was talking about deltacron is uh I'm, I'm not sure how well that would have been caught by the filters actually but there are plenty of examples of where basically poor filtering has led to um either missed mutations or um artifactual mutations which aren't actually there um i think there was a example of that with the um v3 uh with I think V4, um, no, 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 it was with V3 missing a mutation uh, just consistently because of uh, effectively a dropout leading to the um, uh, leading to a the primer getting the reference base getting used instead of the uh, actual mutation. So filtering is very important. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this idea of mispriming that's when uh the, the correct primer doesn't but one of the one of the two pi primers or both don't bind to the correct they don't bind at all and therefore and then you get some of sec, some secondary priming from something else maybe the template or another primer uh those things can cause problems in the analysis so so that the uh primer filtering or the you know the the the, the insistence that um amplicons start with the correct left primer and end with the right the correct right primer is a great way of removing misprimed data which can as, uh, as sam just mentioned cause problems with analysis and that's probably the main reason that we do it um okay more questions there are so let's try and get uh let's get get through all the questions uh danilo says you showed a probable contamination scenario where the sequence have a's and t's in the same position but couldn't it also be the case of simultaneous infections with two different strains of the virus? That is entirely correct. So that was a slightly simplified example. Um, when you have, um, uh, if you have a patient, uh, especially actually chronic patients, which is another thing I study, um, you can end up with these quite diverse um, communities of uh the populations rather of SARS-CoV-2 in the same patient, and therefore you can get uh, minority uh, variants uh, in the in your BAM file, which are effectively steamrolled over in the consensus. So, I think it just it, it, use we have to engage our brains. There's not I don't think there's any single way of processing this sort of data that will cover all bases like that. So. If in doubt, go and go and look in the BAM. Is really my my uh, my uh, my advice. There is what I do. 
I think our experience in the UK is that contamination is quite quite a lot more common than mixed mm -hmm. infections. So mixed infections de definitely do happen, um, and particularly in times of high prevalence. But contamination happens more often. So that's yeah. the, that's the reason for that simplification. Um, so there's some kind of confusion about different pipeline versions. So uh, another question from Dinello is: Is the Nextflow pipeline the one that's in NF core? Um, so uh, do you want to answer that? I don't believe it is. It is. That, I think that might be a different version. I, I haven't, actually haven't looked at the NF core one. I think that's. I think that one's called vi something like Viral Recon, and I think that that is a kind of derivative pipeline of these pipelines, but it's yeah. it is a different pipeline. It shares probably the same ideas and the yeah. same underlying uh, yeah. method, but I think they are recoded from scratch. They're different pipelines. Yeah. Um, okay, and then related to that, Andrew asks, what would be the advantage of using this pipeline over the one created by Epitome, which is the ONT kind of cloud bioinformatics um, resource? Uh, their one is called WF Arctic. Yeah, uh, I think I believe that's. I'll. Uh, I saw. I saw um, someone who works on that on the guest list, so I'll, I'll be careful here. But um, I think it depends on which you're asking about. If you're talking about um, Matt Bull's version, which is the current public version, I would say that the based on what I've looked at in the uh, code, I wouldn't say there's a huge amount of differences. Uh, however, I think with the version that I'm currently working on, there are some uh, distinct advantages, which are um, uh, the uh, Mamba, use of Mamba for one, uh, the I've got, uh, and the use of a line trim and the length filtering approaches. I think those are the really big advantages of the new version, but unfortunately that's not quite public. So uh, yet, so what, watch that space, but um I think my again, understanding is, is, is somewhat based on is somewhat based on the existing pipeline yeah. uh, with some additional pieces, and I think it mainly uses Medaka, but mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it uses the, it's the same underlying software. Yeah, it's mostly the same. Yeah. Right, um, and Gustavo asked, "How do you get SNPs in MinIron?" Um, I think you covered that, Sam. But how do you get variant calls from MinIron? Uh, so you effectively you will align. Uh, the AmpCon, assuming you're talking about AmpCon sequencing, uh, to your reference, then you look down the list uh, and you, so uh, effectively you call a mutation based on how likely you, or you call a SNP based on where it differs from the reference. And obviously uh, Nanopore does have a higher uh, error rate than Illumina. So you do have to be very mindful of that. But it, it does come down to how many reads have X base versus Y base. And, and then you have to uh, use thresholds and uh, minimum number of calls that match the majority, uh, that match the reference versus the SNP. Um, but um, yeah, it really does come down to how many Cs, how many Gs, or Ts or As or whatever. Yeah, I mean, there are, there is also obviously we use specialized variant calling software. So Medaka and Nanopolish are ways of trying to extract more information from Nanopore data um, by having some model uh, of the sequencing error, because obviously uh, there is a significant sequencing error in ONT, particularly around home polymer tracks. So there's a refinement there to say what is the most likely variant based on the data that we see given the understanding of the nanopore error model. But yeah, um, okay, I, I'm gonna close this in a second. Uh, Gilherm asks about multi-fast day references. Would it be possible to use them with Arctic? It would be extremely helpful uh, for investigating viruses, multiple chromosomes, such as flu. Um, yeah, that's a great suggestion. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take that as a feature suggestion. Um, it, 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 it should and could be possible to implement um relatively easily but uh we just haven't gotten around to doing that but we'll take that as a feature suggestion thank you uh thanks for your presentation what is the normalization value used for ONT says Laura oh uh, I guess the question is what is the normalization value for rather than kind of what the value is um we normalize um down to usually 200 fold coverage 
because we find that including more data slows the pipeline down but doesn't change the results so so the align trim pipeline throws out data after it sees uh, by default 200 fold coverage of a particular amplicon that's configurable um, and then I think finally, I hope I didn't miss any. Uh, oh, no, there's a question about insertions from Artem. Uh, having problems calling an insertion with AT1 lineage earlier, earlier last year. Um, Artem, I wonder if you were using the Nanopolish or Medaka pipelines there. It should call insertions pretty well. Insertions are not that difficult to call. Uh, certainly 12 base pair ones in mm. Nanopore data should be callable. So. I, if you could give us some more information about that, maybe on the Slack, we could look into that one, but it should call insertions quite well. Um, and uh, the follow up question was, are NextFlow Arctic pipelines already published on GitHub? Uh, yes, they are. We'll post the link in the 